Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 104, Living Witchcraft with Lizette Alvarez. Yes, I was so glad to have Lizette on the show. They are a wonderful human being who creates some amazing, amazing audio drama and uh, talking about their experience living with witchcraft. We talk all the time about how some of the stories that we learn about are not in history books and you close them and put them away, but living traditions that are practiced all over the world every day by lots of people. So it was super cool to take what some people may consider just a historical thing and learn all about the depths and like many, many varieties of witches living today. Hell yes. And you know, Amanda, you know who I, we're, we're recording this a couple of days before Thanksgiving. You know who I, I, I love and am thankful for? Uh, is it our Patreon family? Yeah, it is. You got it. Especially our newest patron, Rebecca. Thank you and welcome. And our supporting producer level patrons, Philip, Julie, Christina, Eeyore, Josie, Amara, Neil, Jessica, Phil Fresh, and Deborah. And of course, those legend level patrons for whom we brave the post office every dang month, even in these very gifty months. Stina, Jordan, Jess, Sarah, Zoe, Sandra, Audra, Mercedes, Jack Marie, and Leanne. We are just so thankful for you. We will give you the biggest pieces of turkey or tofurkey if that's more your style. Man, I had like a vegan stuffed like cranberry stuffing inside an acorn squash one year at Thanksgiving when I was vegan. It was so good. Dang, son. Julie, what were we drinking during this episode? That's a great question, Amanda. Um, I decided to make something, in my mind, a little bit more witchy. So it was a absinthe infused cocktail of my own creation. It sure was. It was delicious. Can't recreate it, but I enjoyed it at the time. Nope. Uh, I will try and do something close for our patrons who get our recipe card level, but it won't be the same thing because sometimes you just want to get frisky with your uh, cocktail making. (laughs) Most definitely. And this week, instead of recommending like a podcast or a TV show, obviously Julia and I are both watching a lot of Great British Bake Off. Um, I actually wanted to recommend in this uh, season, whether you are traveling or doing traditional stuff or making a new tradition or just being like, no, this is my day and doing your own thing. I love to take time to do like big picture thinking when I'm traveling, especially or on holidays or on staycations or snow days. Something about being outside of my normal routine uh, really helps me to be creative and to think about um, big picture projects and stuff I otherwise wouldn't think about in the like day-to-day hubbub of life. So uh, this week, as I am traveling, I'm going to be carving out a little bit of time um, in my my destination city to hang out with my laptop and get some good coffee and think about what is next for me and the show and Multitude. Oh, Amanda, that's so sweet. I love that. Thanks. You know what else I love? Our sponsors. And we're sponsored this week by Backblaze. You can get a 15-day free trial by going to backblaze.com slash spirits. And we're also sponsored by Calm. Get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash spirits. And every day our art is sponsored by those beautiful, lovely human beings who support us on Patreon. And every week we, you know, give you another way that you can support the show or encourage you to check out something that we recommend. Um, But honestly, the fact that Julia and I can be making a living that we don't have to take days off of our day jobs to try to travel and spend time with our families. um, It's just all brought to us by those of you on Patreon. So thank you, patrons. You're all wonderful. And if you're listening to the show and you have a couple of dollars to spare once a month, um, maybe consider uh, pledging to our Patreon at patreon.com slash spirits podcast. Yeah, we are deeply thankful for you. We are thankful to each other and to Eric and for all of our Multitude fam uh, for being in this wild journey with us. So we hope that y'all have a wonderful week if you're celebrating. And if not, that uh, November weather doesn't treat you too bad. But in the meantime, enjoy Spirits Podcast, episode 104, Living Witchcraft with Lizette Alvarez. 
Amanda, we are joined this week by Lizette Alvarez, who is the producer of Kalila Stormfire's Economical Magical Services, one of my favorite podcasts at the moment. I, You know I'm a sucker for audio drama and also witches and just everything that is going on with that whole podcast. And so, Lizette, and welcome. Thank you. And economics. Very important. <laughs> we love... We don't like capitalism, but we do like business. Yes. Well, uh, we all got to mix the monies, right? In this capitalistic hell state. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I'm happy to join you guys. I'm really excited to uh, talk about some of my favorite subjects, including the occult. Ooh. Ooh. So do you want to start out with maybe telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and then what topic we're going to be talking about this week? Yes. So uh, again, my name is Lisette Alvarez. Among other things, I am a producer of Kalila Stormfire's Economical Magic Services. I am also a voice actor for Magic Kingdom, which is also a very magic-y, Disney-y type of uh, podcast, uh, an audio drama, which has been very much uh, me tapping into my child self, which is a magic of its own. You're one of the few people that can get away with sounding like a small child, yes. and it's very impressive. I have a lot of fun doing it. It is it is uh, uh, tapping into the Disney child that I am, always am. Um, <laughs> so uh, another thing about me is I am actually a practicing witch. I identify as pagan. I am actually an initiate of a uh, what's called a mystery tradition um, called the Order of the Elemental Mysteries. And um, I've been an initiate for about a year uh, and a couple of months now, actually. But I've been part of this spe- specific group and its specific teachings and you know, engaged in its specific teachings uh, for about five years now. Okay, fascinating. Uh, What did you like grow up? What was your background kind of growing up in the religious sense? Okay, so it's kind of interesting. I am Mm -hmm. half Canadian, half Cuban. I'm a military kid, so moved around a lot. And honestly, when it came to religious and spiritual upbringing, um, my mom's family was mostly agnostic, atheist, and my dad's family was different. Uh, The Cubans, so even for Cubans, and Cubans are also super witchy in general, they tend to say that they are Catholic. My family was not Catholic. My grandmother and grandfather were actually part of um, and actually ended up being uh, fairly high up in a Catholic adjacent um, religious tradition called the Rosicrucian Order. Um, that is a fantastic name. Whoa. <laughs> so uh, they 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 were there. They did that for a while. My grandfather is actually currently a feng shui master and um, does a lot of Chinese astrology um, and teaches Chinese astrology. My grandmother is just a straight up witch, and um, both of them actually owned a store. Um, basically, your average mystic mystical store that you'll see like you know where you get your crystals and where you get your weird books oh yeah sure sure um through the 90s so when i grew up i basically grew up in the store and it's called the fairies or it was called the fairies ring and so amazing excellent not this, only, that's one fairy ring that you want to step inside yes <laughs> yes it was and of course my grandmother is very much close to uh doing fae magic and fairy magic she has um, a garden of fairy houses that she makes. Yes. Will Love you it. share a photo of that with us if you have some? All right, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I essentially grew up, you know, visiting uh, their, their, visiting my, my family in Miami, in Miami, Florida, um, and actually staying in their store while they worked and uh, watching, not, watching in their back room where they also did rituals, apparently. Awesome. Kiki's Delivery Service and Spirited Away and all sorts of great uh, movies um, uh, while I was a kid, but also, you know, like hanging around their store and reading their books. So, yeah, very unconventional um, <laughs> grandparents. I think you could probably say that, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so I did actually, you know, da- I dabbled in Christianity for a little bit. Sure. Some some of us do. <laughs> and uh, eventually, like around when I was 16, I uh, got in touch with what I truly felt was my spiritual alignment, which is like nature based. I was very much, I felt the divine okay. in nature. So largely it came from me researching witchy stuff 
And um, I was moving a lot. I lived it a lot. I lived most of my high school years in uh, a couple of countries in South America. So um, Mm -hmm. South America is also very witchy in a lot of different (laughs) ways. Um, So I, yeah, yeah. Moving around in those circles um, in high school and online, I I picked up a lot of things, did a lot of, knew a lot of things about how to meditate, um, how to kind of connect with nature and nature spirits. A lot of my work was very, unstructured. I'd never had a a group that I went to. It was pretty much the stuff that I learned from my grandmother and grandfather and um, things that I kind of picked up as I went, as I went through life. Um, And my current spiritual group is the, uh, is kind of the first, first formal religious group that uh, our spiritual group that I've um, been a part of. Can I ask about uh, how you went about finding the group? <laughs> so um, you can find one near you. No, it's it's really <laughs> it's really along the lines of uh, I I came to D.C. I moved to Washington D.C. for graduate school and for work, and um, I decided to go to uh, after about like eight, nine months, I decided there there's an event every year in a lot of places around, this, especially the United States, but around the world called Pagan Pride Day. So beautiful you can find you can find one probably near you um uh, they're they're every they are everywhere and i actually found the group that uh that actually hosted the event um ended up being the group that i uh was a part of so they we have an interesting structure where they're the public facing arm so there's the order which is kind of the religious order and then the public facing arm is called connect dc and we do public ritual and um pagan pride we didn't do it this year but um, Pagan Pride Day was one of the things that they do as an offering to community. And um, so I got connected with them and met my current uh, spiritual teacher and uh, high priestess, Katrina Messenger, who is a black woman. She says a recovering Marxist and um, wow. activist. She's she's pretty freaking awesome. Uh, and she's, yeah, electrical engineer and mystic she sounds amazing she is amazing so uh yeah she so i got to meet her and a couple of my um my current brothers and sisters and in the order and honestly i got i basically got started going i enrolled in their um they have esoteric classes that focus on personal growth and that's how i um really started focusing and developing some of the themes that i actually used for kalila stormfire Mm mm-hmm and some of the, the the conversations that I bring up and and concepts that I work through actually came from uh, my work with the reflection school within within that within that group. Oh, that is so cool! Yeah. Um, with that a uh, uh, nice chunk of background yes. in mind, do you want to tell us what your topic for the week is? So I am very excited to talk about uh, one of my favorite things, which is living witchcraft, and really, it's it, the I want to kind of cover some of the, not necessarily falsehoods, but like how pop culture views witchcraft and how actually living and using witchcraft um, and kind of the definitions and how, um, especially how spirits brings up some really interesting stories um, that a lot of people really see as uh, part of their spiritual background too. Mm -hmm. Um, I think those are, those are the main topics of discussion that I am excited to talk about. Awesome. Uh, do you want to get us started off then? Yes. All right. So, awesome. So one of the things that I kind of wanted to do was definitions. Uh, this is usually the... the no, very important. <laughs> I love oh, a yeah. good definition. Hard, hard. I love a good glossary. I'm ready for it. I am going to be your mystical glossary. Here's my grimoire that I opened. <laughs> no, I don't have yes. that. If you want to insert like, you know, creaky book opening... <laughs> Eric, please insert creaky book this here. This is the a fully you. sound design episode of Spirits. Right. <laughs> um, okay. So first of all, uh, talking about witchcraft. Witchcraft is a... All the definitions I'm about to give you are very broad. Witchcraft is a craft. So it's this idea that they're skills-based um, tools and uh, practices that really have to do with um, shaping yourself and shaping the world around you. Um, Alistair Crowley, who is, um, a lot of people say is the father of modern witchcraft and especially specifically Western modern witchcraft. It feels like witchcraft should only have a mother. 
Yes. Probably. There is no mother. The earth is our mother. No, that's true, the love and love. True, true, You're starting us off strong with Aleister Crowley, though. I'm <laughs> yep. very excited. It's a choice. <laughs> it is a choice. Um, so he, he's problematic in a lot of ways. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, got to gotta give give kudos to uh, him really breaking open what a lot of Western witchcraft is. Um, and ha- his definition of magic is something that actually I was recently in a class and we were talking about the definition of magic and um, a definition that it seems to be very relevant and a lot of people kind of agree with, especially in, again, Western tradition, is that magic is defined as the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. This includes both mundane acts as well as ritualized magic or witchcraft. So I think that's a pretty solid definition of what Western witchcraft is. Um, You can, of course, define witchcraft in a variety of of ways um, when it comes to indigenous traditions or folk magic, what's considered folk magic. The problem with defining witchcraft is that it's not tied to a spirituality or tradition, right? Mm -hmm. It is a practice. It is a craft. So when you talk about, um, for example, folk magic or folk witchcraft, you can look at like Appalachian magic. And most of the people who practice it will call themselves Christians, right? Mm -hmm. So this, the, 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 and especially even if you go to West Africa, um, to like Burkina Faso, um, a lot of the people there will consider themselves uh, aligned with Islam or Christianity, and they will still practice what we may define as witchcraft um, mm. and folk traditions or magic, right? So yeah. trying to say witchcraft is only something that Wiccans do or pagans do is really a, f- a fallacy. And I think that's really important to know, especially when um, we consider pa- how witchcraft is kind of presented to us in right. um, pop culture as well. And I think this also goes to, you know, kind of defining witchcraft as something that is like Harry Potter or or even like uh, the Hollywood versions of voodoo, mm-hmm. <laughs> that, which it has a whole thing behind it that, you know, whole other yeah. story, whole other story. I'm not going to get into that just yet, but really when it comes down to um showing witchcraft as a as something that people people want to define as a, a specific religion or specific culture um it really depends on what point of view you're coming at it from because a mm. christian a, a christian or like a baptist who you know grew up in southern alabama is going to have a very different concept of witchcraft than a cuban who grew up in cuba <laughs> Um, yeah. in, especially in uh, areas that that have that really weird syncretic tradition of Catholicism. Uh, might it be useful to think of witchcraft almost as like analogous to prayer in that it can be like like the concept of prayer, what it looks like, how it's used, how it's practiced, you know, depends entirely on kind of the framework, like the religious framework in which it's being understood? Sometimes. I think that's sometimes useful. Um, and for certain practitioners, that is a very... Uh, it's very close to how they define witchcraft. There are people, there are witches who are atheists. There are people right. who are who consider themselves pagan. So using prayer, it does have kind of like you're you're sending it out to a greater than you. Some atheists do define as you know that there is some kind of greater you know uh, greater than you function, but they don't necessarily u- use the the term prayer. I would say that this idea that witchcraft is not mundane. There is a lot of things that people. Uh, I know uh, my group specifically. We talk often about using witchcraft to change ourselves, and you can use psychological terms to define what we're doing as witchcraft. You can also go to psychology and like Carl Jung, and he was big into the occult. So a lot Mm -hmm. of those concepts, um, you know, it really is, uh, it's very amorphous. It's very porous. There's, there's, there's a lot of uh, um, concepts of witchcraft that really don't defy, defy definition, unfortunately, as I'm trying to give you a definition. (laughs) All good things do though. Yes. So yeah, uh, I think that covers the definition aspect of 
of I think of witchcraft specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, of course, to not to say that every um, folk tradition or every indigenous religion has something like witchcraft. A lot of them don't. A lot of them don't have something that they would call witchcraft or they would accept as being called witchcraft. And it's really important to, to kind of acknowledge that those variations of of how people see the world those cosmologies are valid in their own way and like not to to belittle them because of that and not to belittle them because they do have that right sure how do you define pagan so pagan is also one of those hard to define um we're just terms. starting off with like the oh, hundred God. level questions yeah it's <laughs> people like to call it like an umbrella term so uh usually you can say that it's a nature-based type of spirituality unfortunately and it's because pa- pagan is tied to a term that has to do with like a, a the hill folk or, or people who lived on the land so yeah. when people say you know pagan is a nature-based spirituality it's also sometimes kind of iffy because there's a lot of people who call themselves techno pagans who do all their magic and all their spiritual work through technology, various technologies. Mm-hmm. My so, brain just started blasting the girl with the dragon tattoo uh, yes. soundtrack. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's that's essentially like y- you can, again, take it where you want to. And some people also do bulk at the um, the title of pagan. I know some people who practice voodoo and santeria who don't want to be called pagans because the concept of paganism is often tied to western magical tradition or western pagan traditions right. and the concept of it being land based is not doesn't encompass all of the spiritual aspects that um that they actually pursue right Mm-hmm. Um, that there is, there's not just land, it's not just nature, but there's also something other than nature that they work with. So mm-hmm. it, paganism is also, again, <laughs> problematic. De- definitions are problematic. But for the large part, um, pagans are e- like nature-centered or pretty much you can say anything except for the very strict definitions of the Abrahamic religions and the Buddhist and even Hindu, but again, like I've, we've had Hindu, um, le- like religious leaders come to pagan pride day. Like that's, wow. so sometimes there really does a kind of defy definition. And because mm. paganism, you can be, there's people who identify as pagan and Christian. It's really hard to, and I think, but that's for, for me, one of the beautiful things of learning about spirituality and religion is just how, messy it can really get yeah for sure jules we are sponsored this week by backblaze do you know backblaze is i do isn't that a place i can put my things and i back them up and then if my computer crashes they're not just gone exactly it is that little icon in the in the menu bar of your computer where if you drop it or spill a glass of whiskey on it as i have done in the past to a computer uh, you are not totally screwed because Backblaze gives you unlimited cloud backup on Macs, on PCs for just $5 per month. This genuinely is one of the best things that I pay for every month because Backblaze makes sure that my music, my photos, my videos, all the videos that I create, the documents, like all of my multitude stuff is all backed up. It is all safe. If I ever had to restore them, I could download them from the web onto any computer or have the mail or even overnight a hard drive to me with all of my stuff on it. It is safe. It's amazing. We love Backblaze. And you can try a 15-day free trial at backblaze.com slash spirits. Amanda, hasn't Backblaze like restored an incredible amount of files too in the past? Uh, We are told that they have restored 30 billion files for people, which, whoa. That is amazing. That is so cool. And listen, the software just works. It doesn't annoy you. It doesn't upsell you. The billing just just happens. It doesn't like take up a bunch of memory or Wi-Fi time on your computer. I love Backblaze. We love the team. We love the service. So check it out. Absolutely free 15-day trial at backblaze.com slash spirits. We're also sponsored this week by Calm. Amanda, do you get stressed? Like me. <laughs> I know. It's a funny uh-huh. question. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, how about sleep? I have trouble sleeping a lot. 
Uh, last night, I was up till 3.30 in the morning worrying about stuff I did in the past and can't change. Same here. <laughs> That's why we are so excited to partner with Calm. They are the number one app for sleep, meditation, and relaxation. So Calm gives you the tools you need in order to live a happier, healthier, and more mindful life, which don't we all kind of need that? I sure do. Uh, so just five minutes of Calm can change your entire day. If you head to calm.com slash spirits, you'll get 25% off a calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of premium programs like guided meditations for issues like stress, anxiety, focus, relationships. They got everything. Uh, they also have sleep stories, which are like bedtime stories for grownups. And there's there is so one cool. called the Nordland Night Train that I am obsessed with, and it is only for premium members. So if you want to check that out, definitely got to go do your trial. Seriously. So for a limited time, Spirits listeners can get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash spirits. This includes an unlimited access to all of Calm's amazing content. And you can get started today at calm.com slash spirits. Thank you so much, Calm. And thank you to Backblaze. Now let's get back to the show. Um, I did want to eventually touch upon um, like pop culture in witchcraft. Yes, please. Because when you suggested this, you talked about ghost hunters oh. and we talked about how Zach Bagans can fight me in a spaghetti warehouse parking lot. Anytime, um, Zach. Any state. Anytime, Zach. Anytime. I'll set up the Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> That's our final Patreon goal is just to get That's Zach it. Bagans to fight me in a parking lot. <laughs> so... Fun story. I was uh, at, on vacation, and I don't have cable, so I haven't watched uh, the Travel Channel in a while. And I love the Travel mm. Channel, though. <laughs> and until Ghost Adventures until Ghost comes Adventures on, Adventures come and Great. then you just want to fight Zach Bagans. That's exactly it. So when I was in college, I actually loved watching Ghost Adventures because it was on Netflix. And I just oh, it's binge- very watchable. Yeah, it, it, it's very bingeable too, especially when you're making terrible decisions um, at 10 p.m. alone in your apartment. <laughs> so aren't we all in college? Yeah. Really? So anyway, I'm on vacation. I'm in a Airbnb that has cable, and I decide to watch Ghost Adventures with my partner, and um, the two of us are watching and making fun of it. And it is set in like in Oregon. They are at this, uh, they're at this kind of abandoned town. So of course they film it at night and it's, and they bring a priest and they bring in people who say that they've been possessed by the evil spirits who are there. And I'm like, yeah, you know, this is, this is, you know, basic ghost adventures. Make it as spooky as possible. Yeah. Just, just do it up. <laughs> And priests make everything 20% creepier. Right. Most definitely. It's, it's not it's the not the exorcist, it's the exorcist um if it was in Oregon. <laughs> and outside in an abandoned town. Yes. So, uh of course, you know, the, the, Zach is like doing his whole like I'm also getting possessed and feeling bad things. And of course, this this is all fun and games until they start talking about. So, like they they ask the priest and he's and that if there's any like groups that have been doing stuff like that they know of, and they're like, yeah. So apparently, there's these group of witches, and some people say that they've come here directly and done like mysterious ritual. But they said that every year they have a camp of witches nearby, and they're right nearby. And like Zach's like. They're like right here. They're like over there somewhere. Like, and they're, <laughs> so they keep talking about this, and the and and they even say that they um tried to interview some of these witches, and you know they they wouldn't want to say they're what are they hiding, what are these witches hiding, and as they're talking about this, I'm like this. You know what? This sounds. I'm pretty sure like they're not they're not lying about the witches gathering part because there's a lot of witches in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> sometimes they, they gather. gather sometimes. Yeah, no, there's actually, there's gathering. So I, um, I kind of looked this up. I actually Googled it uh, to see if the, the, the town could, w- was near any event that I was familiar with. And turns out that um, something called uh, Reclaiming's Witch Camp happens every year right near this town. 
And witch camp is basically a, you know, spiritual retreat for witches. Um, specifically people who, uh, actually, my tradition kind of takes a lot from the reclaiming tradition, which is a lot about aesthetic ritual and self-development and justice magic and some pretty cool, fun stuff. So yeah. when I heard this, I was just laughing. And we actually had to turn off the episode because I was like, I need to tell everybody that <laughs> Ghost Adventures did an episode talking about... Hold my beer. I have news. <laughs> there, There is nothing like going on a retreat with a bunch of your friends and colleagues and then someone from Ghost Adventures wants to interview you. That's just That would just ruin a retreat. <laughs> Yeah, or like, I don't know, privacy and safety. So apparently um, uh, uh, there is a article, and I can probably also share it, where... Um, Please. The, it's called The, the Wild Hunt. So it's, a pa- it's like a pagan-centered um, mm-hmm. kind of magazine, like online, online magazine. And um, <laughs> they did an article saying like, hey, Ghost Adventures talked about, like tried to interview the pagans. And of course, the pagans were like... Fuck no, we know what you're going to ta- do to, to to us, or like, we know exactly what you're going, how you're going to portray. We us. know the villain edit you're going to put on this. We know what's up. Yep. So they kind of like, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, and um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this kind of goes into the whole, you know, pop culture, how the occult is seen in majority culture. Hmm. So I, I like I have I have a lot of feelings about that. Um, personally, I have I have definitely like struggled against certain people's preconceptions of my religion and my spirituality. Um, from the joking aspect, like, do you sacrifice a virgin every Sunday? <laughs> do- Yikes! Uh, I mean, like someone would probably notice if we did. I know. Not gonna lie. And and we do have a, a like we we joke around in in my group that like we have a specific you know there. It's hard to find a virgin these days. Like that's true. <laughs> it really depends on how specific you are with your level of like what makes a virgin exactly. a virgin. Exactly. So as long mm. as you haven't done one, at least one thing, you're considered a virgin. So it can still work. I can still that's, sacrifice anybody on the street. That's fair, I suppose. That is true. This you is sarcasm be like, to be clear. <laughs> we're, we're definitely not talking about act- actually sacrificing a person but i could also be like have you been skydiving before and someone says no they're technically a skydiving virgin right now we are skydiving because we're hurtling through space maybe it's true Ooh. i mean oh. aren't we always aren't we always we, we were born skydiving <laughs> <sighs> anyway yeah so i have a lot of feelings about um, yeah, the, the majority culture's view on um, witchcraft. And a lot of it is tied with um, the gendered aspect. I mean, we can talk about to the, um, the fact that witches and evil, even like villains in, in uh, movies are portrayed in a very anti-Semitic way. Mm-hmm. Um, you could talk about how uh, a lot of magic that's associated with um, black and brown people are seen as demonic and evil and um, yeah so th- there's there's a lot of racial and gendered um, associations with magic and majority culture and mm-hmm. you also have like the ones that are seen as even like the the fluffy and love and light they're always you have you essentially you have the white woman who's very like you know, very calm and 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 uh, loving, and then you also have the um, the was it the magical Negro um, yeah. trope? Yeah, that is that is a thing. So, yeah, there's space Jews, there's fantastic racism. TV tropes actually has a really good kind of breakdown and list of places that this uh, you know these many tropes pop up. Yeah, no, honestly, like it, you can you can go through so many of them. Um, and honestly, part of it also kind of that the one the one thing I did want to talk about is this treatment of um, witchcraft as either completely tied to the 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 uh, frame of um, specifically Christianity, but a lot of times like Abrahamic traditions, um, or on the other hand, as something completely fantastical and has no grounding in reality and no no actual Mm -hmm. experiential or group um group 
belief um, in the real world. And this is, you know, this kind of talks about, you know, how we talk about mythology and not just mythology mm -hmm. in Western traditions, but mythology of and 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 uh, you know religious stories from other uh, parts of the world. So even when we when we say Hindu mythology, it's still it's part of an active religion, living tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, a lot of that is uh, kind of skimmed over, um, are seen as, and this is this is the colonialist. Um, influence i think is mm -hmm. that that it's it's a uh, savage or inferior or less developed that the these types of traditions are not as sophisticated or not as or um, false ground or not as grounded in reality yeah mm -hmm. like uh, one of my favorite things uh, and actually a really big part of my own spiritual practice is storytelling and storytelling as a kind of truth-telling uh magic and um one of the things that I love to to learn when I was actually when I was in college, I took a number of classes on um, non Western religions, and um, one of the one of my favorite classes was on oral traditions um, and oral storytelling. Um, and some of the things that I think are really interesting is the the way that non-Western view of time and non-Western view of what is fact and what is fiction right. and what is embellishment is really, um, again, going kind of going, calling back to our, you know, issues with definitions, very amorphous. It's very porous. So when mm -hmm. you have a story that is about a type of hero and how he or she um, ha got to a certain place or got a certain skill, um, in a lot of ways, it, it really does tell the truth about that society or about that culture's heritage. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not, it doesn't tell the whole story when you just call it a myth. I, I think when it came to when I was studying uh, religion and mythology and folklore in college, that was as a freshman and like really starting out early on, that was very much a difficult topic for me to kind of comprehend at the beginning because I was coming from a history background mm -hmm. and obviously a Western white background because that's how I was raised. So that was like one of those things where it finally, like, when it clicked into my brain, it was this really transformative experience for me and like just my understanding of like religion in the world. And I, I love that you brought it up in the conversation here. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things that I always love to just kind of muse about is like, you know, how many of what we call these myths or these creation stories actually have some element of truth or understanding mm -hmm. that's just being used through many, many years of um, religious context or spiritual or cultural context um, that we just don't have because a lot of, the time western tradition strips context yes it does yeah it absolutely does i mean that's kind of the point of the scientific method right is is to like distill out uh you know things like context like uh history like tradition like metaphor you know and to only value those things that can be you know written down and quantified and abstracted in particular ways um right. and that's useful for like chemistry and for you know whatever certain kinds of medical studies um but that's not the whole of how human beings learn and you know transmit knowledge yeah absolutely and um i really one of the things that um my tradition is actually alongside um these <laughs> one because it was created by a black woman and a black woman in America, a lot of the way that we interact with uh, our gods and our our traditions and our practices is from a understanding of being aware of cultural appropriation and taking things out of context. Um, yeah. One of the things I really appreciate uh, with Katrina is that she constantly calls back to the origins of whatever practice, whatever teaching that she does. Um, mm -hmm. to really kind of, and this is something that um, most oral traditions around the world do, is they call back to what was the origin, who was the person who taught you this. Um, and that's also a big part. Uh, that's at least a big part of my tradition. And it's a big part of a lot of non-Western religions um, or Western non-Westernized religions, I think might be right. a good, sure. 
good way to put it. Also talking about uh, kind of pop culture is this, one of the things that I like to, to note is that the way that certain um, sh- especially TV shows showcase actual witches or showcase people, even if they, they kind of like talk about the, yeah, they're pagan and they're, or they're Wiccan is usually the go-to or they, they, they try to give the actual context behind, um, voodoo or Santeria. Mm-hmm. Um, it is on a very shallow level and it's almost always through the lens of, um, a Western work and Christian American view. So this mm-hmm. idea that this is a, this is weird, it's kind of dark, and often, like, in, in police procedurals, it's almost always this person who's like, I did this because I felt spiritually compelled to sacrifice <laughs> yeah, it's this criminal, person. For- it's demonic, it's anti-Christian. That's often, if not yeah. the text, then the implication. Exactly. <laughs> um, and as much as I, part of me still loves it for some reason, Supernatural is one of the worst Yep, like the second episode, they have a Wendigo as the like monster of the week, yeah. and it, it's Oof. very cringeworthy. Yeah. It's very, very bad. Oh yeah, and oh, there's also the one episode where um the witch, one of the witches that they work with, has a black woman who turns into a dog as oh, his no. as the witch's familiar. That oh, no. was like oh, oh no no. <laughs> Just, just oh, oh no! In general, and we can talk about the J.K. Rowling scandal with Nagini. Oh, we can yeah. talk about the new Charmed reboot, where they're supposed to be Afro Latina, but they are for some reason tied to like Welsh and oh. Celtic mythology. It's, it's uh, there are a lot of things. There is, and one of the things that um, and I actually did this with Kalita Stormfire is, and I had this conversation with one of my one of of the sensitivity readers um, was a reasoning behind why uh, Desiree, one of the characters in um, my show, is a Black non-binary person and they are very connected with Aphrodite, a Western Greek goddess, right? And a lot of this is something that I've had a conversation with um, a lot of people, which is, especially in the United States, the primary context with non-Christian religions is western gods so the yeah. celtic gods and any anything that especially if you're a millennial and you look up paganism i know so many black and brown witches who have western gods as their primary deities um and mm-hmm. it's really only until like recently including myself where people actually feel comfortable going to their ancestral like going along their ancestral line or going along um you know, other cultures. And it's one of the big things, one of the big conversations is, and I don't necessarily feel fully um, prepped to be able to talk from this perspective, is the Black American connection to religion um, Mm -hmm. in the United States, right? That there's, there is voodoo and santeria, but there's, especially like Black American there's not a lot else. There's not much else right. that um, mm. other than Christianity, which was imposed upon um, Black African slaves. So, I think there's a big con- like there's there's an important conversation to be made, not only about um, traditions that are being kind of brought forward that are brought from the past, um, like what we consider dead religions like uh, Greek mythology, even though the Greeks mm-hmm. still do practice. Yeah, they still do stuff. They still do the, the the Hellenic the Hellenic tradition is they've been doing that. That's still part of their culture. So, this mm-hmm. concept that there's certain gods that are dead are still kind of not quite accurate. Yeah. Um, but that even now, um, one of my favorite, I would say one of my favorite like online pagans that I follow um, is uh, it, it's. An account called uh, her name's Brie Luna, and she is the founder of the Hood Witch, and she mm-hmm. has really kind of revolutionized the um, online witchy um, aesthetic, but also mm-hmm. the connection from like modern witchcraft to mm-hmm. people of color, right? So there's yeah. there's a lot of witches out there, including um, you know my teacher who is not white, and a lot of people who are you know not 
uh, straight um, or not Western that are also mm -hmm. trying to uh, get a better understanding and bring some more commentary from a point of view that is not uh, that is not Western, not white. And we can also talk about um, one of my favorite stories coming out of um, Standing Rock, um, the fight mm -hmm. against um, the pipeline there, is the way that um, Native Americans and the various tribes that came and like centered around that was very much rooted in their spirituality. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a very visible view of what an indigenous religion can, um, can inspire, um, within, within their own activism. Um, yeah. and I know I'm my, my order and a lot of the groups that I've associated with also root their magic in activism. So, and their witchcraft and activism. I know pretty, I, love that. I know recently people have, uh, you know, popularized the uh, hexing of certain public fi figures there was just an article out today about someone, a woman being like, oh, well, it's a it's a rough time to be a Republican because witches are cursing Brett Kavanaugh. I'm like, uh, oh, yikes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Try again. Yeah. All right. So I, I, I have my personal personal feelings about hexing sure. public figures. And part of me part of me does believe like it's not going to be very effective. That's fair. Often like you know, I, I have the I have the belief that especially when it comes to witchcraft and magic, that if you're a public figure, you have kind of things cancel out where you have yeah. a lot of people sending you a lot of protection energy and a lot of people who are trying to like tear you down. So mm -hmm. it kind of all cancels each other out. So I, I don't, I don't participate in that necessarily. And honestly, I think the people who actually are doing magic that will work, don't talk about it. That's probably true. And that is something that we see in pop culture as well is uh, magic and witchcraft are kind of coded as like secretive because they are either illegal or covert or like private. Um, yeah. And the implication is like, oh, and they should be because they are not like, quote unquote, like normal or mainstream. Right. So it, it kind of surprised me initially to hear you talk about you know, public performances or demonstrations um, or public good actions that are part of your community's, um, you know, values. So can you talk a little bit about how the kind of like personal to public split of your personal practice? Yeah. One of the things that we learn in our tradition um, and that I've actually learned outside of this specific t tradition is kind of like the powers of the witch. And I think this is, I think it's called the witch's pyramid don't quote me on that. But um, there's like kind of like the four powers of the witch. It's um, to know, to will, to something. And then the last one, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I love that. Learn. And to be silent is actually a power of the witch, considered a hmm. power of the witch. And so this idea that you really do have, it might be to love. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> it's something. Um uh, one of the things that um, I know that I've I've worked with my group on is that we have multiple layers to our to the way that we work. So we have our public arm, and because we believe that if you can you can work on yourself all you want, and this is a very Western belief too. This like self actualization, mm -hmm. um, individuation stuff like that, right? Um, but but if you do not act with your community, if you do not give back the, the stuff that you've worked on, if you're not able to then go out in the community and like kind of work with that with your community, you're not really fulfilling the, the as that aspect of being human, right? Mm. So we do this public arm as a service to our community and the fact that our community in return has already helped us with our own self-actualization and development. Um, so there's that aspect of giving gifts kind of to the community and providing services and support. And then on the other end, I am part of what's called a mystery tradition. So, um, I can't talk a lot about it, um, <laughs> but it, it really, it comes down to being silent and, and actually holding things. One of the things I can say, and this is something that, um, my teacher Katrina always says is, I can ask anybody, what is mystery? Like, what, what is mystery? Like, how, how do you define mystery? Mm. And her answer is waving a hand right in front of your nose and saying it's right there. 
<laughs> it's wow. always I right like there. That. So the idea is that you, the, the fact that you don't talk about it is because that you can't really talk about it. You can only experience it. And a lot of the work that we do is, is to experience it. And granted, there is a long history of people having secret orders in order to protect themselves and the people around them um, and having certain types of um, rituals that are, that are secretive. Um, one of the, one of my favorite stories and favorite like moments in history, or I guess religious works is the Eleusinian mysteries. Hmm. So the Eleusinian mysteries was one of the longest running communal rituals. Um, and it was set in Greece, ancient, so it's, it was in ancient Greece. I can't give you time mm-hmm. dates, whatever, but it was That's sen- fine. essentially, it was a mystery um, ritual that anyone could participate in. Woman, man, slave, freeman. Um, you just needed to know Greek. You could, you'd had to speak Greek. I can't remember if you had to be a Greek citizen or not. There is very few writings on it because it was so secretive and nobody broke the vow of silence. Wow. For hundreds wow, of that's years. that's really cool. Yeah. So the, this idea of like silence or mystery or, you know, keeping, it's really actually a way to acknowledge the value of experiencing that instead of just talking about it or writing about it. Yeah. Mm. So um, that's one of my favorite. Yeah, one of my favorite. And, and there are some groups now who in, are trying to revive the Eleusinian mysteries, even though they don't know all of what was in it. <laughs> don't know exactly what to do, but we'll figure it exactly. out. I mean, that's the spirit of it, right? Exactly. That's that's, that's exactly how, how I've been told about it. But um, yeah, the the this idea of keeping certain things secretive is also, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's something that is, again, depends on how you get, go at, at it. Um, this idea that the in-group versus out-group kind of suspicion can grow out of silence, right? Or yeah. out of like making sure you don't talk about it. But I think in my group, and I know a lot of other groups do this too, in having a public arm, you're you're fulfilling both ends. You're fulfilling, your, you're honoring your own personal experiences or your group experiences that are very personal and very, and, and, and very um, carefully curated in, yeah. in a way. But you're also offering some of that mystery as well or supporting the, 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 your community's experience of mystery um, and self-development alongside that. You're controlling your own narrative, you know, like you're meeting people where they are in a, in a tactical way or in the way that will most benefit them. Um, right. And I think that's awesome. Like, I think, I think mystery is inherently anti-capitalist, you know, like yeah. not, yeah. not evangelizing and not, tr- you know, not having your end goal being like the takeover of the entire world. Like it's anti-colonial, it's anti-capitalist. Yeah. I, I think it's, it makes so much sense that that would be, uh, you know, a, a value for, you know, people who practice. Yeah. And I, I, I really do um, appreciate the, order and the, the group of people I'm in and because most of them are, you know, not, you know, they're people of color, they're queer, they're uh, women, non-binary. Um, it's, it really is uh, uh, justice focused in a lot of ways. It's understanding that you can't self-actualize in a c- culture that's toxic. You can't yeah. actually do that. So what do we do? We do our best <laughs> to be human and try to encourage other people to be as human as they possibly can. Um, And it's always, that's like, that's the magic of it all too. That's uh, the, which the craft that we curate is, is to support that type of story, that belief that um, we're human and, and our magic and our will is what makes us even more human and allows us to become more human. Amazing. I think that is a great place. I think that's a great thought to kind of leave our listeners on today. Uh, Lizette, thank you so much. Would you like to plug any more of your stuff? Maybe just again? Yeah. So my very long podcast name is (laughs) Kalila Stormfire's Economical Magic Services. I'm the producer and um, I I play the main character. Um, She does a great job with it. It's very good. (laughs) <laughs> I have a lot of fun with it. And the second season is coming out February 2019. Uh, so to stay tuned for that. I don't know. You can also see me at lisettealvarez.com and follow me on Twitter at Lisette Walking. That's uh, to spell my name. It's L-I-S 
E-T-T-E, walking like you're walking down a road. Because I, I, I like to travel. I'm a big traveler. So mm-hmm. um, that's, that's, that's why I have my name as Lisette Walking. <laughs> and we'll have all your links in the description of the episode as well. Awesome. I'll send you all that too. Um, but yeah, thank you so thank much. You. For- thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. No, I'm excited to to hear the edits and I apologize for any uh, weirdness. <laughs> no, this um, was no worries at all gold. All. And remember, listeners, to stay creepy. Stay cool. Thank you again to Backblaze and Calm for sponsoring the show this week. Backblaze gives you unlimited cloud backup of your files at backblaze.com slash spirits. Try out that 15-day free trial. And Calm is the number one app for sleep, meditation, and mindfulness. Get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash spirits. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.